The Premature Transfiguration by Thomas Ligotti Read by Jeff Clark Another party, this time very remote, a sprawling old house at a forest's edge, moon-stabbing pines in the background. Everyone was very ill-looking, the worst I've seen, but elegant somehow. The wax-faced women wore long gowns with long sleeves ending in satin gloves, stockings covered what little I could see of their legs, and what hair they had left was used to veil, with pathetic sparseness, the jaundiced flesh of their foreheads, jaws, and cheekbones. Elaborate eye makeup helped them enormously. The men resorted to dark glasses and large hats with ample and somewhat floppy brims. At least most of the men so equipped themselves, this time, and the ones who didn't I deeply wish had. All were holding champagne glasses with galaxies of bubbles sparkling from their stems to their brims. But of course even such dainty glassware seemed to burden those thin and hard-to-control hands. Frequent spills were to be expected, though as always they did their best to keep this to a minimum. I witnessed two such mishaps which soaked the front of their poor victims' expensive evening clothes, and I'm sure there were many more. Fortunately, the champagne was a colorless liquid, the doctor showing great considerateness in this detail, and only left a wet patch which dried up soon afterward. I decided to wear dark glasses for once but my full head of well-groomed hair still made me stand out in the crowd. The doctor spotted me almost immediately and guided us into a quiet corner. You could have worn a hat, you know, he scolded. You never wear either a hat or glasses, I replied, and I've always meant to ask why you keep that thick beard of yours. You must be a source of despair for every man in this room, myself excepted. I'm their doctor, though they may occasionally despise me for it. In their hearts they're glad I'm not as they are. How do you like this party? For some reason I didn't bother with the usual lies. You can't really expect me to be enthusiastic, I said, but the doctor pretended not to hear. My suspicion is that he actually takes a host's pride in his handling of these terminal affairs. For all I know, he may even relish his proximity with the horrible. On the contrary, my own interest in these gatherings can only be attributed to the remuneration I receive for my services to the doctor and his patients. Were it not for me, I cringe to think what would happen. Timing is everything when it comes to preventing pain and preserving dignity. Nevertheless, I'm ready to do whatever is required just as long as the job is done. You're a little early tonight, aren't you? He asked, glancing at his watch. You want me to leave? No, not at all. It's just that, well, you can see how nervous they're getting now that you're here. I think they thought there would be more time. You could show a little feeling anyway. And what if I did? I said in a tense whisper. Do you really believe that would help matters? He knew it wouldn't, and said nothing in reply. You want me to get lost for a little while? I said, my hand discreetly hooding the words. The doctor nodded gravely. I think I'll just wander around the upstairs of this opulent big house. Give a shout when you want me to start. He scratched his beard audibly, and I took my leave. Upstairs much longer than ever before. Lights didn't work. Sat in a trapezoid of moonlight for many silent moments. Began to get worried and came downstairs before getting the doctor's go-ahead. It was quiet, much too. The doctor squatted on the landing of the staircase, his face buried in his hands. He was half sobbing to himself, saying, Wrong. Wrong. All wrong. What happened? I asked. Where is everybody? They all ran out the back door, he said, pointing. They must be down by the lake by now. No problem, I said consolingly. I'll just finish things there. 
He stared at me straight in the face, and I didn't like the look in his old surgeon's eyes. You don't understand. What do you mean? I asked without having to. They still have much of their brains left, he answered, also without having to. But I did not expect him to add, and mouths too, mouths that can speak to you. There was, of course, every reason for my not hesitating another second, for not thinking about it at all. I proceeded quickly, though not wildly, toward the door at the back of the house, but by the time it slammed itself behind me, I was running as fast as I could down to the lake and the pines. The moon overhead was full and bright and beautiful. I followed the voices which mingled with the sounds of the wind. When I reached the lake, I saw them all scrambling along the shore, but some of them had already begun that kind of dancing which is so dreadful to watch. None of them was larger than a dinner plate, and their multiple radiating legs, with pincers by now, made them look like unholy pinwheels spinning in the moonlight. Very dreadful. And the doctor was right. They still had much of their brains left. Too much. They knew what was happening to them. Not like the other times. And they did have their mouths. Yes, indeed right in the middle of their brittle pink bodies. When my presence became generally known, they began scuttling around my feet. Kill us, kill us, they chanted in their many tiny voices. Kill us before we change any more. Some of us are dancing ones. Some of us have gone into the lake forever. Kill us, please, kill us. That's what I'm here for, I said, but only to myself. I picked up a few heavy rocks and went to work. I think I got most of them, too. Later, when I returned to the house, I told the doctor I had got them all. He didn't challenge me on it. Needed to believe me, poor man. Also, he promised to take precautions to ensure that this kind of thing would never happen again. Gave me a bonus that seemed to make it all worthwhile. <laughs>